Amen. Are you guys ready to get into the word today? All right, why don't we stand to our feet one more time before we get into it. Just reposture ourselves before the Lord. I love what Michaela encouraged us to do this morning. As we just take a deep breath. Can you just put your hands over your heart and just take a deep breath? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is life. Your word is hope. Your word is an anchor to our souls. And we thank you that as we dive into your word this morning, you will speak to us. We thank you, Jesus, that you did not shut your mouth whenever you went to sit down at the right hand of the Father. But you still speak to us and you speak to us through the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, we invite you to come, to sit with us, to be with us, and to open our eyes to the truth of Jesus. We thank you that as we leave today, we will not be the same. We will not be the same. We will not be the same, but we will look more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Slap somebody a high five. You got to say slap a high five. If you say slap somebody and leave too much space, be some fights breaking out up in here. We don't want that. Amen. And as you're sitting down, grab your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. So excited to get into the Word today. Uh, Last week, Pastor Josh did an incredible job of starting us off with a brand new series called The Secret Life of Jesus. Somebody say The Secret Life of Jesus. Really what we want to look into with this talking about The Secret Life of Jesus is the prayer life of Jesus. I love what Pastor Josh said last week. He said, if we want to do the things that Jesus did, we need his prayer life. If we want to walk like him, if we want to talk like him, if we want to act like him, if we want to love like him, if we want to be patient like him, if we want to do miracles like he did, if we want to look anything like Jesus, we need his prayer life. And I think particularly with everything that we see going on in the world today, right? Horrible news last night, right? That, that's, that's insane. I mean, we, I got a text from somebody that said, welcome to World War III last night, right? Because we, with all of the tension that we see, that, that things are, are, are not slowing down, but they are mounting up, they are revving up. When we look at the hour that we are living in, it is an important thing to consider the firmness or the shakiness of our spiritual practices and our spiritual disciplines, this morning as I was getting ready to come and speak, I, I started thinking about Corey Tin Boom, uh, who, who stood with the Jewish people uh, in Nazi Germany. And I started to think about the fact that it wasn't her family's business, it wasn't uh, all of the vacations that she was able to go on that helped her to stand firm whenever she was deported to the concentration camp in Nazi Germany. It was her devotional life. I started thinking about Brother Yoon. Many many people may not know who Brother Yoon is, but he is probably the father of the underground church in China. And for many years, he was imprisoned in China, had his legs broken, was tortured, went through all kinds of different things. It, It wasn't his position or his title or his religious activity that kept him while he was in that dark and difficult hour. It was... His spiritual life, Uh, his nickname is the spiritual man, that it was his spiritual life that kept him during that time of difficulty. And so as we look at the urgency of the hour, when we consider even not what's going on in the rest of the world, but when we look at, y'all, I don't know if you know it, it's election year. And uh, from the looks of things, we're not going to calm down. In this nation, from the looks of things, people are are still up in arms. They're still an enraged culture right now. People are still uh, not dealing calmly and civilly with political issues. There is an air of hatred and anger resting on our nation. And so we have to consider, as we look at everything that's going on in the world, we have to consider the urgency of the hour 
and we have to determine the things that are most important in our life. We have to determine the things that are going to keep us firm if the world continues to be shaky. Right? If we learned anything from the pandemic, if we learned anything from the difficult, the difficulty that we have experienced in the world, it's that finances come and go. Health comes and goes. Life comes and goes. But Jesus tells us that there is a way to store up treasure, that there is a way to store up life in an area of our lives that will not rot or decay. And he's speaking of our spiritual life. He's speaking of our secret life. He's talking about the strength of our inner man or woman. And so today, as we continue to look at the secret life or the prayer life of Jesus, I want us to understand that, that we are talking about what Pastor Josh made mention of last week, that Mary and Martha reality, that there are many things that are good, but there is one thing that is necessary. Martha was busy with serving, busy with doing all kinds of different things, but one thing was necessary. She sat at the feet of Jesus and she received from him the life that would hold her in moments like losing her brother. Things that would hold her in moments like losing Jesus himself or, or thinking that she had lost Jesus himself. Right? And so we have to consider as we look at the urgency of the hour, what's going to keep us, and there's no better place to look than the life of Jesus. What kept Jesus on the cross? What kept Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane when he was sweating blood? What kept Jesus when the pressures of busyness in ministry were weighing him down? What kept Jesus whenever people were pulling on him with a desire to make him king and to draw him out of the place of prayer so that he could be with them all of the time? What kept Jesus with what we're going to talk about this morning in the wilderness? What kept him? Because the secret life of Jesus, I want to tell you, was simultaneously the place of his greatest guidance from the Holy Spirit and the greatest attack. Jesus' time in the wilderness in particularly was a time of great fulfillment and a time of great turmoil and difficulty at the same time. Did anybody find Luke 4 already? Amen. It says... In Luke 4, verse 1, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, and he was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Somebody say, for 40 days. 40 days. It's going to be an important thing for us to come back to. And it says, He ate nothing at all during that time and became very hungry. Somebody say, very hungry. Very Look at your neighbor say, I'm hungry now. Look at your other neighbor and say, I'm hungry for Jesus too. <laughs> we had to super spiritualize that. So let me give you a brief timeline of Jesus' uh, time leading up to his fasting and praying in the wilderness. So uh, Jesus, he comes out of seclusion, right, for 30 years um, we're, we're not really sure exactly what he's doing. We know that he's with his father who's a carpenter. We, we have a brief moment uh, where we see him in the temple uh, where he is going in and he's asking questions of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the high priests of that time. He's asking them questions. And then we get a little uh, verse in Luke 2 that says, And he grew in stature and, gr and favor before God and man. And so we see little moments like that, little specks of Jesus' life leading up. But basically before he gets led into the wilderness, he has this moment where he comes out and, and, and people, there are some people who know who he is, some people who don't know who he is, whatever. But he walks up and John sees Jesus and he's coming down and he, he wants to get baptized by John. John looks at him and he's like, far be it from me. Uh, I, like, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm nothing and compared to you, like how on earth am I going to baptize you? And he comes and he says, we have to do this to fulfill all things. Jesus is baptized. 
by John the Baptist, and when he comes up, some incredible stuff happens, right? It says that the heavens split open. Like, we get amazed whenever there's like a a really big uh, cloud going, and we see some of the sun rays popping through. Like, we look at things like that, and we're like, wow, that's amazing, that's beautiful. I can't imagine what it would look like for the sky to rip open, Right? And like, can you imagine being there at that time? If you're just standing there, it's like, oh, just some guy getting baptized. Holy smokes, right? (laughs) Sky rips wide open. Next thing that happens is the Holy Spirit descends like a dove. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, the Holy Spirit's not a dove. I had to take white Jesus away from us on Easter. I'm taking dove Holy Spirit away from us today, okay? The Holy Spirit is not a dove. He, it was a description of how the Holy Spirit came down to rest on Jesus. Holy Spirit descends softly, lightly, gently, like a dove, and remains on Jesus. After the Holy Spirit descends and remains on Jesus, the Father speaks out with this booming voice from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now at this point, I would have been on Google looking up Airbnbs, like looking for the, we're going to go celebrate. This is like, like we, we have like little minor encounters on Sunday mornings and we walk out like, you know what? I'm going to Outback today instead of McDonald's because that was such a good Right, we want to reward ourselves for encountering the Lord. Like this is, this is good stuff. We had a good time in church today. Right, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go have an even better time. Like, I, like we, we, if, if if the skies split open and God started speaking verbally over us, we'd be like, man, it is time to celebrate. Go on Airbnb, call the family. I'm calling everybody in. This is gonna be a good time. This is not what happens with Jesus. It says immediately. He turned from the Jordan and was driven by the Holy Spirit. Somebody say, by the Holy Spirit. Spirit. This is rough for our bless me, bless me mentality, right? This is rough for our American ideas of Christianity. We're looking at things like this, like the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. Now, we are not talking about some cute kind of like, this is not a getaway. These are not beaches. This is mountainous, arid, dry ecosystem that's loaded with danger. We are talking about the Judean desert. I don't know how many of you have been to Israel, but uh, the, if you have ever been in the Judean desert, but in areas like Masada or in areas like Jericho, it is hot and, it, and you get sweaty, like you can be sitting on a tour bus all nice and comfortable in the air conditioning, you walk outside, you're sunburnt, you're sweaty, it's bad for business, right? Jesus is led into this wilderness, and he's facing things like risk of dehydration, hypothermia, heat stroke, flash floods, and even there's one point in Mark where it says he was there with the dangerous animals. I think the only way that Mark could have known that is if Jesus would have gone to him and said, y'all, There were some dangerous animals out there, right? This is not cush on a cotton, like on a bed somewhere, just laying down, waiting for the Lord to speak to him. No, he's led by the Spirit into a perilous, dangerous place. And he's hot and he's hungry. And if it were me, I wouldn't want to pray. I lived uh, for a couple of years in Mexico, uh, me and my wife, and I remember one of the first times that I went down to Mexico. Uh, this is after I had learned at least a little bit of Spanish, enough Spanish to get in trouble, and enough Spanish to preach a little bit the gospel, okay? So I learned a little bit of Spanish in this time, and uh, we were going out and we were evangelizing in this village. And uh, uh, the, way, the place that we lived, um, it is, there are certain days where it's like 160% humidity. And it is, it is hot, hot. Look at your neighbor say, hot. It is hot where I used to live at times. And so we were, we were there and we were hiking in this village and we're going down and, and people do not have insulation in their homes in this area. People do not have air conditioning in their homes in this area. We are talking, we're talking bamboo and tin, okay? These are not good insulators, 
These are not things that keep you cool and calm and ready to encounter the Lord. These are things that keep you hot, hungry, and not wanting to pray. Okay? So we're there. We're evangelizing. And we're with this, uh, this man. He's about 60-something years old, maybe 62 years old at the time. And uh, we're, we're in a village that's across the mountain from where he lives. Now, what we do in Mountain Gateway is we'll go out and evangelize, and then we'll go to a service where everybody that we just evangelized to can come and hear the gospel that night. And so we were about a 40-minute drive or an hour-and-a-half walk from the house that we were going to be having church in that night. And so I'm walking around with the founder of our organization, Mountain uh, Britt Hancock. We're walking around. We're evangelizing, and I think that I am going to ride in the air-conditioned truck with Britt to church. But Britt looks at me, and he says, hey, Miguel's going to go invite a few more people. This is a 62-year-old man. He's going to go invite a couple more people on the way back to his house. I want you to walk with him, and you'll be at church with him tonight. Now, I hadn't been a missionary for very long at that point, but I was, and, and also, I was a young man. I was like, okay, this is going to be leisure. I'm walking with this 62-year-old guy. It's not going to be that bad, right? Except this man walked, grew up his entire life walking everywhere, okay? And so we did not go on a leisurely stroll to church. We are walking through 150% humidity, about 105 degrees heat, it, uh, over and under and every kind of way that you can imagine. We're walking to church, and whenever I get to this man's house, again, I am hot, I am hungry, and I don't want to pray. We're sitting there on the bench, and uh, he had gone back into his little kitchen and he asked his wife to make us some drink. And I'm just sitting there. I'm like, surely this man has a refrigerator or something <laughs> with some, like, cold water. <laughs> like, I, something. I just, like, I just know something cool and refreshing is going to be given to me. I'm sitting there. And what starts off as a few drips on the floor turns into a puddle about this size of my sweat. And I'm just like breathing heavy and I'm trying to get my, like my senses about me. And Miguel walks in with hot tang. I don't know if you've ever had hot tang before on a sweaty, hot day. It is not, it's not good. All right. Tang is great when it's cool and refreshing, when it's boiling, piping hot to kill all of the bacteria. It is not great. Okay. So I sit there and I sip hot tang. And all of a sudden, uh, church is about to start, and I was supposed to lead worship, and I was supposed to preach that night, and it was the last thing that I wanted to do. Has anybody else been in a situation where you're just like so overwhelmed by all of the stuff that's going on in your life? You're like, I'm hot, I'm hungry, and I don't want to pray, right? The beautiful thing about Jesus that we can learn from his life is how to remain in the place of prayer in the midst of deep difficulty and even natural humanity happening on the inside of us, okay? So there's two details that I want to talk about this morning as we get into the message, which, if you haven't caught on by now, is called, I'm hot, I'm hungry, and I don't want to pray. <laughs> there's two details that I want us to focus on uh, about Jesus' time in the wilderness. And the first thing that I want you to see is that Jesus was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days. I don't know why, but in my life, whenever I would read the scriptures about Jesus going into the wilderness, it was almost like Jesus would go, he, like, he gets baptized, the Holy Spirit comes and rests on him, he hears his identity spoken to him by the Father, and then it's like he's led to the wilderness, and I, in my mind it was like, okay, Holy Spirit, I'll see you when I get back, bye. But that's not what happens. The scripture makes it very clear to us that Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days. Somebody say, led by. Yeah. Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit. Not just led to, led by. This is a very important detail. I want you to keep this in your mind. He didn't, he didn't end his communion with the Holy Spirit at the entrance to the wilderness. He didn't end his fellowship with the Father when he got to the place of difficulty. He was led to the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. He was led by the Holy Spirit 
for the 40 days that he was in the wilderness. Amen. That leads us to the second key detail that's very important for us to understand. Is that Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness for 40 days. The way that our Sunday school kind of mentality teaches us, our Sunday school theology makes us think that Jesus only went through three different temptations. Now, that might be true. It may have been that Jesus went through those series of three temptations during the 40 days. We're not exactly sure when or how those uh, temptations took place. But what we do know is that for a full 40 days, Jesus was tempted by the devil. He's led by the Holy Spirit for 40 days. He's tempted by the devil for 40 days. These realities... We're right on top of one another. They were not separate realities. These were not moments where Jesus was led by the Spirit, then tempted by the devil, or tempted by the devil, then led by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit and tempted by the devil. And these are the the reasons why these two details are important. I want to repeat myself. Jesus was both led by the Spirit and tempted by the devil while fasting and praying for 40 days, okay? This is a a very important detail because as completely divine as Jesus was, he came to the earth to live an entirely human life. As perfectly God, look, Jesus was 100% God, right? And he was 100% man. Oftentimes, whenever we read about the life of Jesus, we excuse his humanity because of his divinity. We look at experiences in the life of Jesus and we say, yeah, but that was Jesus. But we have to understand, he came to earth to live an entirely human life. Therefore, his deity did not exclude him from natural or supernatural disturbances. The deity of Jesus did not make him an exemption to what's happening in the earth. The deity of Jesus did not free Jesus from the circumstances of life. If you guys were here uh, during Easter, I talked about Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 4, where it says, He was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with deepest grief. I'm going to skip around in this verse a little bit. It says, he, it was our weakness that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. Jesus experienced every form of temptation, every form of accusation, every form of destruction that we face. Jesus faced those things too. He's 100% God, but he's 100% man. He's full-on deity, and he is full-on humanity, which we can learn from this that Jesus' prayer life was not immune to humanity. It wasn't the place, Jesus' prayer life was not the place that he went to to exit Earth's atmosphere like Superman and absorb the power of the Son or the power of the Father, right? He didn't leave Earth's atmosphere to encounter something that we don't have access to. Jesus didn't go to the place of prayer and put on his predescendant form to commune with the Father. We, we do have a moment in the mountain of transfiguration where that happens, but, but that's not what's happening every single time he goes to the place of prayer. Jesus had a fully human experience. He experienced hunger, exhaustion, accusation, temptation, and the pressure to neglect prayer because of busyness. He experienced all of these things, but he remained in the place of prayer and was led by the Spirit as a result of his resolution to remain. Which brings us to the next reason why it's so important to understand those two facts, that Jesus' prayer life did not stop temptation from coming, but it kept him from falling into temptation. So Jesus' prayer life 
Jesus is the secret life of Jesus did not cause temptation, accusation, distraction, and the human existence to go away. But it kept him from falling into temptation. And so there's a couple of things that we can learn from this. Number one is in our life, we will experience natural and supernatural disruptions no matter how mature or robust our prayer life becomes. It says in John chapter 16, verse 33, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. Your prayer life will never make you an exemption to the rule. Your prayer life, and I know some of us have been taught this, like, well, brother, if you just would have prayed more. It's like, listen, friend, I've been praying this whole time. Okay, we, we got to get out of this churchy, sassy, like, well, brother, you just should have had more faith. Stop saying that to people at funerals. Stop saying you should have prayed more at funerals for the love of God. People, we, we come to the Lord in faith, and, and yet we still experience difficulty. Why? Because we live in a fallen world. I don't know what you know, but Jesus hasn't come back yet. We have not entered the age to come yet. We have not entered the reign of Jesus Christ yet. We are, the kingdom of heaven is here and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is with us and the kingdom of heaven is still to come. And so in this life, no matter how good your prayer life is, you will have trials. You will. You'll experience difficulty. So many people shaking their heads at me right now because we know. We know some of these saints in here. We know life ain't been perfect. Life is not going to be perfect. Life will not be perfect. Our prayer life is given to us so that we can lean on the Lord in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of temptation, in the midst of hardship, in the midst of distraction, our prayer life is for those moments. It's for, the, it's for all of our life. Now that doesn't take away the fact that God does respond to our prayers and that miracles happen. And I wish I, I, wish I had the formula, Right? I wish I could come to you and say, if you pray this many times and you say this this many times, like all of life, you're going to get your healing, you're going to get this, you're going to get that. I don't know. Listen, in the last couple of weeks, we've been having incredible miracles, right? There's been instantaneous miracles, and then there's been people that I've been praying for for years that still haven't received their healing. And I can't explain to you why that happens. All I know is that we've been given access to the Father in the midst of every single last one of those trials and tribulations. And this is what we learn from Jesus in the place of the wilderness. This is what we learn from Jesus in his secret life, that no matter how robust or mature or incredible your prayer life is, you're not going to become an exemption to the, to the rules of humanity. You're going to experience miracles. You're going to experience breakthrough. And... You're going to experience trials and tribulation. Being tired, hungry, hot, and human is not a sign that you are bad at prayer. Can I say that again for some people? For the people in the back. I'm going to let the people in the back know. Being tired, hungry, hot, and human is not a sign that you are bad at prayer. When temptation comes in the middle of prayer, that is not your sign to give up. It is your sign to press in. When distractions come in the middle of prayer, that is not your sign to give up. It is your sign to press in. You will not be, you're not going to transcend trouble. There will come a day When Jesus returns and there will be no more tears and no more pain. But that day has not yet come. And so we need to stay in the place of prayer so that we can endure when those things come. 
Which is the next thing that I want to point out to us. The, the thing that we can learn from the secret life of Jesus is that we can be led by the Spirit in prayer during accusations, distractions, and temptations. So the same thing that's true for Jesus is the same thing that's true for us. We can undergo temptation and we can be led by the Spirit at the same time. They're not separate. They are going to happen at the same time. You thought there was something wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. It's just like Jesus. You're going to go through both of them. But here's the thing. We have the same Holy Spirit that Jesus had leading him through the wilderness. Jesus said what? This is why Jesus said to his disciples, it's better for me to go away so that I can send you the Holy Spirit. The Bible also says in Romans that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. The Bible also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that you are the dwelling place, the temple, the house, the home of the Holy Spirit. And so, yes, you will have troubles, but be of good cheer. The Holy Spirit is with you. The Holy Spirit is near you. The Holy Spirit is in your being. Romans chapter 8 verse 26 says, Likewise, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Why? Because we don't know what to pray for as we are. We're hot. We're hungry. And it's, maybe I want to pray, but I don't know what to pray. So I have the Holy Spirit for the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. When you don't have the words, you have the Holy Spirit. When you don't know what to say, you have the Holy Spirit. When you feel like it's too much, when you feel oppressed and beat down by the trials and circumstances of life or the devil himself, you have the Holy Spirit. Which leads to the next thing that we can learn from the prayer life of Jesus or the secret life of Jesus is that our prayer life will not stop accusations, distractions, and temptations from coming, but they will keep us from falling into them. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. And one of the most important words of that verse right there is let. Let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Let him guide your life. The cravings are going to be there, but so is the Holy Spirit to empower you to come out of temptation. One of the reasons why we struggle with temptation is because we live life too fast. When temptation comes... We fail to pause and make ourselves aware of the Holy Spirit that's within us. We, we get attacked with lies like, ooh, the way you just reacted to that person, that's who you really are. And we forget that the Holy Spirit is the one who is our potential. The Holy Spirit who leads us in the ways of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. That is who you really are. Your spirit is who you really are. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. I have a body. Wait, I, I live in a body. I have a soul. I am a spirit. So what you're experiencing in this body it's not who you are. The, the Holy Spirit that says within you, don't do that. That's who you really are. And what we have to do is we have to stop listening 
to this flesh. We have to stop listening to those sinful desires. We have to stop listening to the voice of the enemy. And we have to tune in to the truth of the Holy Spirit who says you are pure. You are holy. You are righteous. You are a son. What does the Bible say in Romans 8? That the Spirit cries out, Abba, Father, from within us. Our spirit resonates within us that we are children of God. You know, I'm excited about it because my voice is cracking, right? <laughs> so we are. People in the back, is that guy 13? What's going on up there? <laughs> We have the Holy Spirit. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. We have the paraclete. We have the helper. We have the teacher. We have the comforter. And we can be led. I can't say will because that's our decision. We will if we let. But we won't if we ignore if we are always ignoring the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking within us, we're never, we're going to constantly be frustrated in the midst of trial, temptation, distraction, and accusation from the enemy. So we have to turn ourselves over to the Holy Spirit. I know that this is a hard thing to understand sometimes. Why? Because it's activated by faith. What does Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says? It says that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. In the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How do you live your life? You live your life by faith. When temptation and trial and accusation and distraction shows up, say, God, I believe that greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. God, I believe that my, that my flesh has died according to Romans chapter 6. My flesh is dead. My sinful desires is dead. And I am alive with Christ. Now this takes time. I don't want to discourage anybody in the room. And y'all know me. I'm super real about this stuff. I am not all there. No, no one is all there. All these people walking around like there's some priestly, like no problems at all going on in their life. And I'm just, no. This learning to be led by the Holy Spirit is a process. And you know what helps? Wilderness seasons. Wilderness seasons help us to learn how to be led by the Holy Spirit. If no one else was going to say it, I'm going to say it today, right? There, there comes a point. We look at scriptures like count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And we're like, how? (laughs) How is that verse? How did it make it in the Bible? The people counseling Nicaea should have been like, nope. (laughs) We're not putting that one in there. No, like the Bible says that you have the potential to count it all joy when you fall into various trials. How do you do that? You take advantage of the trial. You take advantage of the situation to be led by the Holy Spirit instead of being led by your flesh. You pay attention to the voice of the shepherd guiding you through the wilderness. So the question that we have to ask ourselves How do we stay in the place of prayer in the middle of accusations, distractions, and temptations? How do we do that? How do we be led by the Spirit, right? Number one, and this, to me, this is the most important one. Well, this one and the last one. The middle one, up for debate, right? But this one and the last one. Listen to this one and the last one. If you listen to nothing else that I say today. Number one, don't believe the lie that accusation, distraction, and temptation are signs of an ineffective prayer life. This is just one of the biggest lies we've ever believed. I was talking to someone just last week who was like, yeah, but, you know, I I go to pray and then all of a sudden I start getting hit with these thoughts. Like, I start thinking about, you know, other people and I start thinking about, you know, I get angry about this and these situations. I just feel like I can't focus and I'm just like, I don't want to pray anymore. And I looked at it and I'm like, no, no. 
No, like, don't believe the lie. Temptation, accusation, distraction, all of those, they're a part of our current human existence. They are not signs of an ineffective prayer life. If anything, we can read into the, the situation that's happening with Jesus and we can, think, we, can, we can understand that it's actually the result of a healthy prayer life. The enemy doesn't want to mess with people who don't understand that they're sons and daughters. The enemy doesn't want to mess with people who don't get who they are in Christ, right? Who cares if you don't understand who you are? Why would I touch you if you're not bringing any damage to my kingdom, right? But when we start to see that the enemy comes rushing in the moment we start to get it, the moment the light bulbs go off, I, I remember whenever I was younger and I was trying to develop my prayer life and I would go into my room to pray and... A phone is the greatest enemy to a prayer life. I want to tell you this morning, okay? That's why I don't have my Bible with me this morning. I forgot it at home, but that's old faithful right there. Ain't nobody calling but Jesus. <laughs> On that paper and ink, nobody calling but Jesus, right? So we're... When the, when the temptation starts to come, we have to understand that number one, it's a natural part of our current human existence. And number two, that the enemy wants us anywhere but the place of prayer. And so what happens is we have to use, we've used this scripture a lot over the last couple of weeks. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 through 5, it says, The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. What are strongholds? They are arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God so that we can take every thought captive to obey Jesus Christ. When the thought comes in, grab a hold of it and cast it down. One of the most practical things that I, I like to do is when a thought comes in while I'm praying, I write it down. Okay? And, and if it continues to come up, I go, maybe this is the Holy Spirit. Right, if I'm reading my Bible or I've decided that I'm going to pray for this specific thing and all of a sudden these floods of thoughts start coming in, just write it down. If it goes away, leave it away. If it keeps on coming up, there's potential, even if sin is being brought up, there's potential that the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, I want you to deal with this today. Not every distraction is of the devil and not every distraction is from God. Not every, not every temptation is from the devil, and not sometimes you're not being tempted, you're being prompted. Sometimes you, the Lord is showing you something that he wants to heal inside of your heart. If a conversation that you had with somebody where you were so angry with them keeps on popping up, maybe the Lord's trying to tell you to repent, call that person and ask them to forgive you. If, you are, if you're dealing with a situation, right, this is another thing that I like to think about. This, this is a problem that a lot of men deal with. It's like they'll go into the place of prayer, and it's like all of a sudden I'm starting to think about work. It's like, guess what? God is a family business kind of guy. And there might be a, a slight chance that the Holy Spirit is actually trying to teach you how to walk in your business with him. He might be trying to give you an idea about something that's important within the way that you are acting, the way that you are doing things in your place of work. Like the Holy Spirit might be showing you that, and sometimes we, 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 we don't realize it, we get distracted by it, and then we just go, well, that was a waste of time, and I'm not going to try and pray again tomorrow. It's like we miss the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to lead us into something. Now that there are, there are other times whenever those oppressive, condemning, shameful thoughts come from you, that's definitely the enemy. 
And you need to take that thing and you just need to throw that one out. If it makes you feel any type of shame, condemnation, like if it's conviction, that's good. That's from God. If it's condemnation and it's shame, then get rid of it. Don't even think about it again. Don't give it a second thought. Begin to speak out to it with the power of the word of God. But I want to, I, I think this is such an important key to what we are realizing as we develop a prayer life is number one, it's not always the devil, and number two, it's not always God. So learn to recognize his voice and cast down the things that need to be cast down, but receive from God the things that need to be received. Amen? The next thing that we have to do is we have to make a stand with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 17 through 18, there's going to be portions of this omitted for sake of time. It says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. Now, I don't want to go too deeply into this because we just had a sermon series about this not long ago. And I want to encourage you, if you want to learn more about how to pray the word of God, please look up the sermon titled Thinking God's Thoughts. Thinking God's Thoughts. And there we we talked a lot about how to practically pray the word of God. But this is exactly what Jesus was doing in the wilderness. We're taking the word of God and we're praying the things that he said to us. We're taking the holy scriptures and we begin to repeat back to the enemy what God has already said to him. That's when Jesus responds over and over again to the devil. It is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. We have to, and listen, sometimes we're like, oh, that's something different. That's not prayer. That is prayer. Partnership with the word of God to confront the enemy is prayer. Partnership with the word of God to confront those invasive thoughts that try to come in and distract you from the place of prayer, that's prayer. Saying, I'm not going to come out of this place, but I'm going to sit at the feet of Jesus just like Mary did, that's prayer. It's communing and conversing with God. It's being led by the Holy Spirit. And I love that Paul says, pray at all times. Prayer is what works when temptation, accusation, and distractions come. You don't need to leave the place of prayer. You need to take a firmer stance in the place of prayer. You need to make a a firmer stand to say, I'm not coming out of it. I'm staying right here. Amen. And the last thing, again, this is a, I want to hang out here just for a moment. The last thing that we do to stay in the place of prayer, even in the midst of distractions and temptations and accusations, ask Jesus to help. Why? Because he knows what you're going through. I hear from a lot of people whenever we talk through Luke 4, Matthew 4, Mark 1, when we look at Jesus being led into the wilderness, sometimes we're like, we ask the question, why did the Holy Spirit lead Jesus into the wilderness? Like, that wasn't a very nice thing of the Holy Spirit to do. (laughs) But it was so important for Jesus to go into that place because in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, it says, Therefore, It was necessary for him, who's him, Jesus, to be made in every respect like us. His brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people, since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. We serve a God who is not far away or removed from what we are going through in seasons of wilderness. We serve a God who gets it. It was important for Jesus to be led into the wilderness because he had to know how to lead us out of the wilderness. He needed to empathize 
with us. And so when you are going through these seasons and you are experiencing temptation, accusation, distractions, whatever it is, right? Jesus wasn't just tempted, Jesus was hungry, right? When you go into the place of prayer and you're just like, I want a snack, Jesus gets it. And Jesus will help you. Jesus will help you go through those things so that you can come out. Like it says, I, I didn't have it in, in the notes, but it says in Luke 4 that Jesus came out of the whole, out of the wilderness full of the Holy Spirit and power. And whenever you lean into the Holy Spirit and whenever you ask Jesus for help, he will lead you. He will be there. Now, listen, I wish that he just took us out of every problem, Right? But he doesn't just take us out of problems. He walks through problems with us. Right? It's just, look, look, you would be a terrible parent if you never let your child fall while they were learning to walk. Why? Because they're learning how to balance. So it's the same thing with Jesus. Jesus, we are allowed to go through certain things. They teach us how to walk like he walked. They teach us how to be as he was in the earth. I love, um, I love one of my favorite statements ever made is never waste a good trial. Never waste a good trial. Everything that we're going through, everything that we are experiencing is an opportunity to learn how to look more like Jesus. Not just in the place of prayer, right? But in everything else that he did. But he did everything that he did through the place of prayer. And so, no, your prayer life is not going to make every temptation, every distraction, every, every, every accusation from the enemy disappear and go away. Now, you might go through seasons of high moments, right? It says in Matthew 4 that Jesus rebuked the devil and he left him, but this important statement is made for a more opportune time. The enemy is looking for the opportunity to slip in and get you to fall. But something, Pastor Sam is going to talk about this next week. The Bible says, watch and pray lest you fall into temptation. Watch and pray pray. Stay in the place of prayer. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Ask the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you. Ask Jesus for help. He knows what you're going through. He gets it. Amen. Why don't we bow our heads and close our eyes in this moment. There's really no other way to say this other than to say if he doesn't live in your heart he can't help. If you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior if you have not acknowledged him as the king of your life if you have not submitted yourself and surrendered to him for him to come and dwell on the inside of your heart then you're going to whatever it is that you might be going through today you're going to continue to go through it and potentially just continue to go through it without hope one of the beauties of the gospel is that Jesus takes our pain and our trials and our circumstances and he gives it a purpose one of the beautiful things about the gospel of God's kingdom is that all that you're going through, it doesn't have to be useless and it doesn't have to be for nothing. That the Holy Spirit can lead you through wilderness moments of your life and teach you how to live with more peace, more joy, more love, more grace, more hope. And so if you're in this room today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, or at one point you were serving him and you walked away from him, from him. I want to invite you to surrender to him today. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, if you call on the name of the Lord, 
you will be saved. All we have to do is call on him. All we have to do, the Bible says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. What does saved mean? Saved means he comes and he makes his home on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit comes, he he empowers you to walk through the most difficult moments of your life. So if you're in the room today and you say, I want to give my life to Jesus, I want to surrender to him, nobody else is looking around, it's between you and Jesus, but all I want you to do is just shoot your hand up to the Lord right now, just shoot your hand up, I see that hand, thank you Lord, I see that hand, thank you Jesus, I see that hand. Thank you, Jesus. Is there anybody else? I see that hand. Wow. I see that hand. You guys can put your hands down. Is there anybody else? I see that hand. Wow. Thank you, Lord. I see that hand, buddy. Anybody else? feel like there's somebody in the room that God wants you to know this is not a thing of shame or condemnation. This does not make you feel bad enough so that you give your life to Jesus. It's, no, he loves you. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It doesn't say for God so hated the world. It's not that God so condemned the world. It says that God so loved the world. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says that the love of Christ was demonstrated that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus didn't come back for the people who had their lives perfectly together. He actually told the religious people of his day, I didn't come for the healed, I came for the sick. He didn't come for the people that thought they had it all figured out. No, Luke tells us that he came to seek and save that which was lost. So I'm just going to give one last opportunity. If you're in the room today and you are, you're dealing with a little bit of shame, there is no shame. All you have to do is just slip your hand up to the Lord right now. Just slip your hand up to Jesus. Surrender to him. Thank you, Jesus. Beautiful. I see that hand. Whew, thank you, Lord. All right. Thank you, Jesus. I feel released now. Now what we're going to do in this moment, we're just going to say a prayer. I'm going to say some words. I'm going to ask you to repeat it back. You just say it from your heart. And all of the people in the room around you, they're going to pray it with you because we're just a big old family here. We love you. We're not going to embarrass you or anything like that. Just repeat these words after me. Say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus to save me. I'm done running, trying to figure out everything on my own. I surrender to you. I give my life to you. I confess with my mouth. I believe in my heart. Jesus Christ is Lord. I ask for you to forgive me of my sins. Something that I want to do right now, just for a few moments, those of you who just raise your hands to the Lord, just take a few moments, and you don't have to do it out loud, but just right there in your own heart, just begin to acknowledge to the Lord the things that you need forgiveness for. And I don't want you to just ask, I want you to say thank you Say, thank you, God, for forgiving me of that. Thank you for forgiving me of this. Just take a few moments and just ask the Lord to forgive you. Thank him for forgiving you. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you.
Now just repeat with me again. Say, Father, thank you for forgiveness. Thank you that from now on, I am your child. You are my father. My life is yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Come on, somebody give glory to God. Can everybody just stand to their feet just for a few moments? I'm going to ask our altar ministers to come down. I want to encourage you, if you just said that prayer with us for the first time, maybe you rededicated your life to the Lord. Some of my incredible friends, our prayer ministers, they're going to be down here. And they would love to talk with you, connect with you, and to let you know what your next steps are in your life of following Jesus. So I encourage you, don't run out the door if you said that prayer. Take some time. Come and meet with them. They're not going to take a super long time. They just want to pray for you. If you need prayer for anything else, if you need healing in your body, whatever you're going through, this is just for everybody. If you need prayer for anything, these guys would love to pray with you and see a miracle happen this morning. Amen. We love you guys so much. Thank you for coming and spending time with us, spending time with the Lord. We love you, and we will see you next Sunday. God bless you guys.